All right, so um, the plan for today, um, two things. One is um, to talk about the um, case study two, take two. And uh, on the screen, I share um, the write-up that I prepared um, for you beforehand. That, um, like last time we talked about how to think about the latest class models, okay? And then in the write-up, this part, I provided a little more um, information about how to think of them, as well as a tree diagram here uh, that might be useful, and then some sample jack script. So like what we did before, I'll give you the time um, to talk with uh, your neighbors, whoever is sitting next to you, to discuss what you did, and then I'll prepare um, a general uh, discussion together. Uh, once you have the uh, small discussion. Okay, so take your time and um, you can use all of the uh, things that you have um, you did so you can bring your write up um, on your computer if you brought it to, to share that with your neighbor. Okay, so pause here and um, let's spend five minutes on this and then we're going to look at it together. Like before, um, anybody who wants to share like what you did and how to do it, as well as any kind of um, results that you have. Um, so just let me know who wants to share, and then I can bring it right up um, on the screen. So, any teams here? Whether you did the same thing as the model, um, the script that I shared, or did you do something else, especially about P1, if you ever want to play with that, as well as the, um, I guess, uh, the, the ZI, whether you also use the one for Earth for the Bernoulli, or did you do something else? Anyone? Yeah, Kobe. Um, so let me, okay. Give me a second. I just want to switch Kobe and. So, um, yeah, that's great. right. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did a fairly similar thing mm -hmm. to the model that you presented. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I think that was different was that we gave a prior distribution for pi, because mm -hmm. um, I don't think we're very sure what mm -hmm. it is beforehand. Mm -hmm. So we gave it kind of a weekly informative beta 1-1 mm -hmm. um, distribution. Mm -hmm. And then since we're trying to see, like we're trying to answer the question of, is there like a guessing group? And is mm -hmm. there a mm -hmm. prior knowledge group? So we set P1 to be 0.5, which is what it would be if there was a, right. a group right. that was guessing. Run, run guessing. Yeah. And then P0 is beta 1 run truncated above 0.5, because if you had prior knowledge, we'd expect you'd get better than mm -hmm. 0.5. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have the model string, which is basically the one that you um, Gave us besides the um, distribution for pi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess we use a and b both to be one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I think that's set there. Mm -hmm. And then, so we ran the model in Jags, and we saw that it placed the first five people mm -hmm. into group one, um, the guessing group, mm -hmm. um, and the rest of the people in group zero, like ninety-five percent of the time. Um, and in fact, a lot of them, like for example, for Z1, mm -hmm. it just kind of gave NAs in the second, the, the like sample size effective, all that. Um, hmm, interesting. And I think that's because it gave this note that like the variables were non stochastic, which mm -hmm. I think it means it just placed them in that group every single mm -hmm. time, which and is you like, can see it, I guess, with this five, yeah, uh, four, four of them's here. So it's the lower. 95% median, upper 95% yeah. mean, everything is zero, meaning that it's always being a one, sorry, always yeah. being classified as the first group. Yeah. And I guess the same goes for ZH to Z15, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's Keep like pretty, pretty confident that mm -hmm. they were placing those groups. And mm -hmm. also for P0, mm -hmm. the mean was like 0.86, mm -hmm. which is about like the same that we got from the last time we did this case study. Mm -hmm. I think it came out that that, that mm -hmm. probability was about. 86 percent so right. mm -hmm. that was interesting mm -hmm. um and we got pretty good um like effective sample sizes and low auto correlations and all mm -hmm. of that we have the plots down below mm -hmm. um there's one for one of the z's it was pretty much placed in its group one almost mm -hmm. all the time besides like one little jump down to mm -hmm. zero so mm -hmm. yeah so then we can kind of um conclude that those first five people you know were um in the guessing group and the rest of the people were in the prior knowledge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so I guess interesting ones, especially looking at the output here, 
is the five, six, and seven, right? So um, five, so anybody remember what was the score for number five? Any chance? 22. Yeah, oh, 22. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, I thought you said I do. I was like, oh. <laughs> 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 uh, okay, 22. And the total is what? 40. Yeah. Right? Okay, 40. So, so let's see. So, so majority of the times, so you can see like the, uh, the middle 95% uh, credible intervals with the median uh, all in the first group and the mean is very close to one mm -hmm. So that's what I guess Kobe was saying earlier here. Yeah, it, um, one of the times one, it got into yeah, zero yeah, the down, down. Right. Yeah, so those will be the case that maybe some ambiguity but very little still very highly Likely to be classified as the random group whereas six and seven even though there's some variability but most of the time is being classified as the um, non random guessing group so what was the score for six and seven? Anybody? 31 31. Okay, 31 31. Yeah. And I guess the rest from eight uh, to 15, they're all pretty high in the 30s, very close to 40. Okay. Yeah. So I guess one more thing I would mention here is about the pi. Because uh, in this case, um, Kobe's team chose pi to be random, and you guys chose a uh, uniform distribution for the pi, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, beta one, one. Right, and if we look at this, so the posterior medium is about 35%. What does that mean? What does that tell us? Um, like about um, a third of mm -hmm. the um, respondents are in the guessing group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which so is that's right. So, um, what I shared in the sample script is fixing it to be one third, saying that there are always um, three of them, oh, sorry, 30%, uh, 33% ish of them always in the first group. but it's probably making more sense, especially we allow each um, observation to be clustered in a different group every iteration, right? So I think uh, just to be like perfectly correct, I think it's a better way to do this with pi to be random because we actually don't know what it is. If you fix it to be one third, you're saying that every time there should be pi, right? But because we're letting all of this to be random, so that will be, um, that will be something um, interesting. And at the end of the day, it's about 33%. Um, every other team did something similar. I noticed you do the thinning for 10, so I guess it was because when you do thinning to be one, it was two. Yeah, the the, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, any other team, any other comments or any other different approach? Josh, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, just give me a second. Yeah. Let me just uh, come back to you here. Josh, and, okay, so. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, our group um, did mostly the same thing, except mm -hmm. for the fact that we gave a different distribution for pi. Okay, so let me calm down. I guess maybe we look at the code here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just give a distribution of beta um, with parameters two and four. Mm -hmm. So why was the choice here? Uh, so we initially thought fixing a certain value for that is not feasible because mm -hmm. we don't really have prior knowledge about that. Mm -hmm. We still wanted to reflect the fact that one third might be a good mm -hmm. value for it. Mm -hmm. So we chose a beta distribution that resembles the shape of like rice skewed mm -hmm. distribution mm -hmm. that has a higher density concentration around one over three. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what beta two comma four looks like. Right, yeah. So this actually a uh, good comment because if you remember uh, early in the semester, we talked about how to play with beta distribution, especially the prior, and we can think of A and B, if we write it this way, that A is the prior number of success and B is the prior number of failures, right? So roughly, I guess we want to do a one to two ratio, right? So you can do any kind of like a one to or two four or any uh, multiples of that. And um, I guess in one of the homework questions, we looked at um, not only like A and B in terms of the prior success number and prior failure number and their ratio, but also just the sum of them are gonna give you the strength in terms of your prior belief, right? So if you choose one, two, or in this case, two, four, overall it's gonna be very weakly. Like you, it's gonna be a weak uh, strength or like a weak belief in that case. But if you think uh, very highly of this one third or the one, two ratio, you can even do like what? 20 and 40 or even like 200, 400. I doubt the results gonna change that much, yeah. Um, I guess I, I don't know like anybody else did something similar or along the line. Let me see. So here your pi. Yeah, so earlier Kobe's pi was about 0.35, right? So here is about 0.32 or 3. So very close. And I guess if I look at the result here, um, 
Yeah, so in your case, um, uh, every time for D5, or like observation five is being classified as a random, whereas the only um, deviation is for C6 and C7. Okay. Yeah, and P0 in this case, yeah, very similar, 86%. Okay. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And Carolyn, you know, this is the only Yes. So I got very similar results, mm -hmm. but I actually used different priors for mm -hmm. P1, P2, and Pi. Mm -hmm. So for P1, I used um, beta 2,2 2, mm -hmm. um, to represent the idea of guessing, um, which we talked about with the, the mm -hmm. successes and failures. Mm -hmm. um, and then P2, I used um, beta 3, 1. Mm -hmm. um, to represent the idea that they have some knowledge that they're getting about maybe mm -hmm. seventy five percent right, right, mm -hmm. um, and then pi just follows um, a uniform zero to one half. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that the um, the per proportion of students guessing would be somewhere between mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, let me yeah, let me scroll down to the results just yeah. because yeah mm -hmm. yeah so they're very similar. Mm -hmm. um, C5, 6, and 7 were the only ones that varied. Right. Um, and then, and the yeah, the estimation for pi is also close. Yeah, to it's also close third. to one third. Uh -huh. And then the estimates for P1 and P2 yeah. are similar to what we had before. Right. So uh, the previous cases, I think uh, the groups put uh, PJ1, in this case, the P1, I guess, in the notation earlier, because uh, that's the case that. Both teams fix it to be 50%, right? Yeah. And this is the case I um, let it to be random, but it's also the posterior estimation is very close. There's some variability, right? If you look at the middle 90% credible interval, but median wise, it's, it's still overall very close. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And then again, all of those cases, effective sample size being NA, and uh, I guess as Kobe pointed out earlier, uh, maybe the error message is not printed here, but or like the wording is about like it's not stochastic, meaning that it never changes. Yeah. So that's why it's always going to be an NA in terms of effective sample size. <coughs> right. And the thinning down here is two, two, right? Okay. And that's also like yeah, there's some yeah, yeah, great. So um, just curious, anybody ever looked at theta? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Let me let me so bring to Maggie's team here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, please go ahead. Um, sorry, let's see. Let's see. Oh, uh, let's see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we also look at data. Uh, theta. Mm -hmm. Um, we found that the first five students have a posterior theta, a de theta around 0.5. Mm -hmm. It's median, and it's also like the last 10 students have their around the beta, the theta around 0.86. Mm -hmm. But we're not sure, like, why would why would we get so similar results across like the same group? Mm -hmm. Because theta. I don't know, like if they have different scores in the mm -hmm. beginning, why would they have like yeah. very great points? So, because uh, the write up you provided might not include that. So, what I would do is maybe I'll just go back to uh, maybe, uh, let's see, I think Kobe is a pretty good example. Where is it? Oh, here, yeah. Uh, so, what Meg is saying that, so it sounds like their team uh, also, so one more thing, just, just really quick. Theta here in this model is random. Okay, that's why sometimes if you want to look at theta itself, you can also put that into the monitor command. And I think that's what Maggie's team did. Uh, so imagine that we did it, even though in this case right now the output does not have it. But if you also monitor theta, you're also going to have like 15 thetas here. Why have it? Oh, great. Okay. Let me, let me go to yours. Yeah. So. Um, I do want to actually discuss the question Maggie just mentioned. So, so it's right below the page. Thank you. All right. So, all right. So theta. So this is the case that has theta. Okay. Great. All right. So I do. Yeah. I'm just going to repost the questions to you all. So in this case, uh, Sarah's team did not include Z uh, or 
Yeah, but it doesn't matter. So the point here is um, what Maggie was asking earlier is theta. Why the theta is so close or in fact identical across those um, observations? Okay, so the question is um, why they are, but what I would like ask you to focus on is the model here. What is theta doing? And do you think the setup actually will just make theta to be the same or identical across those observations? So I'm going to pause here. Uh, let me just like uh, say the question again. So look at the setup of the theta that we have. Theta of each i is the success probability, right, for each observation at each iteration. So that's why the summary that Sarah's team here has is um, so for theta one. So theta one is for observation one. Okay, that's the success probability estimation for observation one across, I don't know, 5,000 iterations, something like that. And you can see that from theta one to theta five. theta five, at least, I mean, the median, I mean, the means can be like the last one is slightly different, but overall they're really, really identical, especially the first four. They're exactly the same. Do you think it makes sense? Because that's sort of like what Maggie was asking earlier. And if you look at the output here, I would say uh, from nine, Z9 to Z15, um, they're all very similar to each other. And um, before I let you discuss, I also just want to point out that look at how close it is, the first four and five to P0. And I also the last P2 10 to be P1, P1 is it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I'm just going to pause here. Uh, the question is why there are and then you go, is there something wrong with the code or this is just how the model is set up? And, uh, or any other discussion questions that you have. Okay. So take your time. All right. So let's hear it. Any other comments about, like, say, is it reasonable to see such an idea? Um, estimation for theta one and theta four, and then later theta eight or eight, uh, theta nine through theta fifteen. Um, I think yes, because when you look above, theta is just defined as mm -hmm. like P zero or P one, depending on which group you're put into, mm -hmm. and so it like makes especially a lot of sense, like in the group that was placed like as non guessers, mm -hmm. that six and seven are slightly mm -hmm. different values because mm -hmm. those were like sometimes placed mm -hmm. as guessers, mm -hmm. so like they got dragged down a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but then like everybody else has the exact same ones, they're all just guessers, yeah, guessers or guessers, right? So and so then it makes sense too that like theta matches P one as well, exactly. Yeah, so the short story is because P, uh, P0 is the one that is being um, estimated for, sorry, uh, P0 in this case I think is a non-guessing group, right? It's the success probably for that group. So for um, the later, uh, the last five or five through seven, so how many, 15 to nine-ish, all of those observations every time is being classified as the non ready nearest group. So their theta is always being assigned to be P0, whatever the P0 value is. And the same goes for the other group, uh, which is um, group one, the random guessing group, but then it's the theta one through four mostly, and then partly five as well. They're always being classified as um, that group. So there, so if we come back to the model stream, which everybody I think is something very similar, um, in a sense that, um, so there are actually many different ways that you can write the model. Uh, for me, I wrote it in the theta just to facilitate because it will need a theta for each observation to, to do the Bernoulli draw or the binomial draw in this case. Okay, so that's why I define this theta. Uh, but there might be a way that you don't even need to. I don't know. Maybe I, there's a way. I didn't write theta. I just put it in there. Okay, let's see. Okay, yeah, so the question, yeah, my point here is the way that I provided the sample script is trying to uh, create a parameter for each observation of its success probability. And then we can, um, based on the value of Z, right, because we know that it's going to be classified in one group or the other one, based on that, that theta is going to be assigned to either P1 or P0. So, um, so that would be the case. Oh, that makes sense now. So I guess, Sarah, just one more thing. Maybe it makes sense to also track P1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I meant to. Yeah, yeah. So I think in that case, because <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> no, like, so in that case, if we did return P1 here, it's going to be uh, very similar to those values. It, it, that will be the other one. Okay. 
So since Caroline mentioned that they their group didn't use the um, data there, so let's let's go back there to see if there's um yeah different way to write the model that you want to do with this. Okay, so maybe tell us a little bit about yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just did two minus mm. equals zi one. So equals zi one is um, zero when mm. they're not equal and one when they are equal. So mm -hmm. if you do two minus that, mm -hmm. then you mm -hmm. get one um, when zi is one and two when zi is mm -hmm. zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I should also mention, I think this way of writing works because uh, their team actually define a vector of the group, right? Because if you, so most of us, I guess, because all of the Jack script that I provided, we just have P1 and P2, they're separate. Right? That's why it's hard to use another like index to get which one they want. But in this way, um, this team is writing pj as a vector of two, right? Yeah. And then because there's one and two, that index you can so you actually need your access. Yeah, so we don't need theta anymore if you do in this way. Uh, but sometimes you will want to return theta just to have a summary. So so many different ways you can do it. And as you can see, theta, the values of theta is really mimicking the P1 or P2 based on the uh, clustering uh, assignment out of each iteration. Okay, so they, they're all equivalent to some extent, and uh, I think this will, be, this will be it. Anything else before we uh, move on? Okay, makes sense? Yeah, so this type of model in general uh, can be used for uh, this type of problem. And I would say this graphical representation that I put over here, so this is uh, exactly what we're doing because we only have two groups, right? And then you're doing uh, like either group one or group two, and then once you're given the group assignment, you're gonna follow a particular binomial in this case. So you can imagine, well, what if I have multiple groups? What if I only, not only have two, but I have three, four, five, six? And that, in that case, instead of using Bernoulli, what we're gonna do is a binomial distribution. So binomial is extension of, um, I would say Bernoulli in particular, also binomial depends on how you think of it. But for each trial, uh, if you only do it one um, trial, then if you have more than two groups, let's say five groups, then you can do a multinomial draw. What we mean by multinomial is you have five different categories and each will have a particular probability and they're gonna add up to one. Okay, whereas for Bernoulli, you only have two groups, so you have P or one minus P. Okay, so in that case, you can put this as a binomial and in JAX is going to be pretty straightforward to do, I think is R multi, something like that. And then you can draw that based on say group one to group five, okay? And, uh, and then of course, if you have multiple groups and if your outcome is not a, by, like, not a count of success, if it's um, let's say a score or um, like a numerical score, for example, then in that case, if you want, you can actually put a normal density there. Okay, so this type of model is really flexible in a sense that it depends on what kind of um, uh, response or outcome variable they have. If it's continuous, you can do some kind of normal, either mixture of normal or, I don't know, log normal, all the stuff, truncated normal, all the stuff that we did before. And uh, the, yeah, the interesting thing here now will be if I have multiple groups, then a Bernoulli becomes a um, multinomial. And I should just like add one more comment because some of your some of your projects are actually touching upon this that well we know that if it's pi which is a success probability that's random if we're using Bernoulli or binomial we're going to use a beta distribution for the pi right because it's conjugate because it's going to be a success probability between zero and one. What do you think you're going to do if you have a multinomial? In a sense that if I have multinomial with five groups, right? I should actually, so like pi one to pi five, right? In that case, I have a vector of five elements. They should add up to one. So I actually need a prior for a vector like that, right? instead of just one scalar. So um, I only expect one group to know the answer, so I'm just gonna <laughs> say it. So um, for a multinomial output, like if you have multiple groups, a conjugate prior distribution is called Dirichlet that you will have one through five in this case, pi one through pi five, and then they're gonna add up to one. So it's a different distribution that you will be able to use, uh, but that will be a typical prior choice for this kind of thing. And it, go ahead. Oh, I was just, is there a situation where you could say like, they're in different groups, but we're ambivalent about how many groups? 
and like mm. it would also do that. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. So, um, yeah, so Nina's question is, well, um, right now, if it's Bernoulli, it's two groups, right? If it's some kind of multinomial, I would have to say, like, I would fix, say, five groups or ten groups. I have to decide that early on. Um, so last time, I think, when I introduced this model, I mentioned a little bit that there are ways that you can let the data decide how many groups you want in a sense that we're going to use a uh, setup that so you're going to have an infinite number of groups that is available, but at each iteration, maybe only a finite number of groups going to be used. Okay, so, so there is an infinite like, uh, version of this that what we call a Dirichlet process. Like Dirichlet is what we were talking about earlier, like you can use for that um, prior distribution, but when we say Dirichlet process um, model like this, what you can do is you can let it to be a really large number, <coughs> like you can't approach infinity, but we can truncate it at a large like 30 or 50 or 100. But then at each iteration, I'm going to monitor how many are being used. Yeah, so that would be the case that you can do. I don't know if Jax, um, I would imagine Jax can do it. It would be more complicated to write the, like the script, um, but there are ways I would um, to figure out like how to assign a Dirichlet process prior that I mentioned that you can let like an infinite number or a really super large number of it and just let let the data decide how many clusters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I should also mention uh, in this course most time we're only looking at outcome to be univariate, right? Like in this case just one score. Or like in the C example is just like one um, for each observation you just have a univariate outcome like the log expenditure and all that. Many times you can do multivariate. They can be all continuous, or they can be some of them continuous, some of them discrete, like categorical or binary. And uh, this kind of models, um, it's interesting, I can tell you more about it after class, but this kind of model can uh, generalize to that cases that I, I can model like either, like say I have two continuous random variables, I can give it a five-area normal distribution, okay? Or if I have like multiple continuous, I can give it a multivariate normal. Or I can even look at one variable at a time and just assign, say, if I have a binary, I give it a um, Bernoulli. Okay, if I have a continuous, I give it a normal. If I have a um, categorical, I give it a multinomial, things like that. And this kind of model can incorporate all that kind of information. And when we say um, clustering, in this case, you can imagine that when we cluster observations, we want to cluster similar observations together, right? That's essentially what it's doing. Every time we're looking at those observations score low, unfortunately, to be the random guessing group, right? And every time we're clustering the other group with the non-random guessing group. Uh, but once you have multiple outcomes, like not only just a score, but you have other information like demographics, whatever, for each observation, when we're doing clustering, we're clustering observations based on all of the information. Okay, so that's the basic of how uh, clustering is done and why we want to cluster. Because then you can put observations in different clusters and then you can have a good estimation about each cluster. Okay, so you're borrowing information within the cluster so you can give a better estimation, things like that. Okay, all right, I think I'll just stop because otherwise I would just keep talking about those uh, <laughs> modeling approaches. But um, this hopefully I think uh, can give you a um, overview of what kind of other Bayesian models are out there. And again, JAX is really helpful, I think, and powerful in many cases that if later on you encounter some other situations or models that you want to try with, I would strongly recommend play with JAX to start uh, instead of writing your own GIF sampler or MC. Okay. All right, so let's stop here.